Good morning. Welcome to Shambles Stay at Home Festival. How are you, Josie Long? Oh, hello. I didn't see you there. Oh, Welcome. Yeah, just over here. Here I am. Here. Um, How are you? I'm good. Did you enjoy your day off then? Uh, I did. I can't recall. We we had a takeaway. We're having a takeaway once a week. It was very exciting. Oh, it was date was very... night again, was it? No, date night is um, Saturday night. You've got to put a rigid, arbitrary routine into your life so that you keep your sanity. <laughs> Sorry, that slightly worries me that you have actually put your date night on the same night that you do a stand-up gig on Cosmic Shambles. As We've if actually you deliberately... checked tonight. It's on a Friday night now. Oh, okay. Oh, 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 it's uh, tonight then? Yes, it Brilliant. is. Uh, uh, half past eight. I think we haven't heavily publicised that it has changed night, so it might just be the five of us talking to each other. But that's, that's fine. what worried me was because I thought, oh my, you've got a date night, and even in isolation, you've worked out an excuse not to have a date. Really, <laughs> sorry, really sorry, Johnny, but I've got a gig tonight, mate. Sorry, <laughs> yeah, got a gig in the house. Um, How the, are you? Uh, I'm what very good. What did you do? I just the normal thing. Well, do you know what? I had a very nice chat with Rusty. Well, I, I talked to Helen Sharman, uh, which was which was great. Uh, the the first British astronaut, and um, then I talked to Rusty Schweikart, which is kind of my my show and tell uh, today. Which was uh, if any of you are watching on Wednesday, I just showed a book called uh, Beyond World, which is uh, Buckminster Fuller and 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 various others talking about possibilities of of, of humanity uh, beyond the planet Earth. And I was talking to Rusty Schweikart yesterday, who was uh, Apollo Nine, uh, which was the mission that test out the lunar module um and uh he did an incredible speech in 1974 it was at an event uh lindisfarne once a year these philosophers and some alternative thinkers etc would gather together and uh he was asked to go there and uh he he arrived and the day before things had been a bit when he arrived he saw that everyone was a little bit antsy and what had happened was the day before carl sagan had done a speech and then someone had asked about ufos and that made carl sagan very angry and he got very annoyed that the person went on about ufos and then charged off so everyone was like oh it didn't go very well with carl sagan did it and then also Russell, you can't really charge off the holy island of lindisfarne unless uh, no, it's within is... the appropriate time frame this is in the Hamptons in uh, off New York. It's it's an alternative Lindisfarne, named in 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 celebration of the retreat. But uh, uh, thank the you. Retreat of the month. Continue. Uh, and um, but it was just this incredible speech that he did, where he kept thinking, "I must write my speech." And then everywhere he went, he'd get distracted. So he went up onto a hill to think about the speech. And then there was a guy in a shack who was just kind of playing. He's the tabla, I think it's called, isn't it? They're, those little drums. He was playing that, and so he got kind of lost in a reverie of thinking about the drumming. And then he went, "Oh, I really, must write that speech." And then he finally got to do this speech, and he he literally just he went, "Oh, I've written one sentence on a, on a card." And he spoke for twenty five, thirty minutes yeah. about. What it was like, because when he was in space in Apollo 9, there was a point where he was doing a spacewalk and the camera wasn't working. So they said, basically, just stay there and we'll just get the camera fixed. And so he was just floating in space with nothing else to do but contemplate. And five years later, he's doing this speech. And it's when he had that moment, which you might have had on stage, where you're saying an idea and you've only just realized as it comes out of your mouth what you actually think about the world or the universe or whatever it might be. Yeah. And it was like five years after his that experience in space, he's standing there. And as he starts to talk about the ideas of cosmic birth, that is what the Apollo mission is about. He realizes really what it meant for him. So that's my yeah. show and tell because it's on YouTube, not the whole thing, but it amazes me. It hasn't had that many viewers and I don't know why. And if you look up, it's just uh, Apollo Can 9. You put a link up on here. We will do, yeah. It's Apollo 9, Rusty Schweikart, seeing a world without borders from space. Ah, oh, yes. It's, okay. Uh, but it's it's a lot more than that. It's not just because I'm sure you may have heard some of the, you know, some of the astronauts talk about that before. It goes further than that. And then also you can you can see the recent speeches he was doing on the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11. So that's wow. my show and tell. I could have shown Oliver che Jeffers' lovely book, but I didn't. This is mine. It's called Steal As Much As You Can, can. by Natalie Ola. Right, listen to this. For many, the 2010s have been a lost decade. Tory austerity has created suffering for millions, as well a generation beset with financial insecurity and crisis. Yet our TV, film, music, art and literature have never looked so affluent or elite. During a period of immense struggle, the experience of the majority has been pushed to the margins of our collective culture by the legacy media and its satellite industries, making it hard, if not impossible, to challenge those in power.
Steal as much as you can is the story of how this happened, exploring the mainstream rise of the upper classes and the corrosive effects of neoliberal and postmodern culture by rejecting the established routines of achieving prosperity and encouraging us to steal what methods and opportunities we can from the establishment along the way. It also offers hope to a bright generation whose potential has suffered under these circumstances, a generation who, through no fault of its own, became increasingly frustrated by our increasingly unequal society. And honestly, there's never been a better time to read it, given that we no longer have the support of a mainstream party. So give it a go. It looks really fun. I'm glad that I heard an, a level of interaction. Papa, I'll see, oh. I'll see you in a minute. My, my daughter is um, experiencing the fury of the catalyst that was the catalyst to this book. She understands the inequality and she is projecting it and manifesting it. I have to say that book, I never, apart, you know, maybe Rebecca Solnit, but apart from that, that is the book that most has Josie Long written all over it, which I know, I know it it's, it's Art well. Emergency, the book. Yeah. <laughs> the, um, so we're joined today by a uh, comedian, author, broadcaster, uh, and, uh, and actor, and oh, loads of different things, uh, but currently in incarceration. Shutty, how, how are you doing? How are you doing? Hello. Broadcaster, that's nice. Yeah, we're all broadcasters now. Everyone's a broadcaster. <laughs> Even you, everyone out there, everyone out there, you're all broadcasting now. Um, I wanted to, first thing I wanted to talk to you about was when you came on Book Shambles, you talked about a book which is now getting mentioned a great deal, which is Station Eleven. Yes. And, and my friend started reading it at the beginning of uh, this. this pandemic and was like, oh, it's too <laughs> yeah, no. Do you think, was it not as well known then? Like, I, because I thought it was so good that everyone must know about it. But it's weird, isn't it? When you really love something, it's a bit like a band. You go, everyone must know about this. And it's really surprising when people go, oh, actually, it's, yeah. It's, I, it's, I, I think a lot of people, I think it was well known. Well known. But I think now it seems that, as you see, yeah, because of the current situation, this seems to be the book which people have found. Yeah most what what was it that first i mean that that was a few years back now what what why were you drawn to it do you like those kind of uh yeah we talked quite a lot on this about those different dystopian tv series novels etc yeah i do i do i think it's really good to read and watch and look at and listen to stuff that isn't like the thing that you produce because i think mm. if you only watch stuff that is similar to what you produce your your sphere becomes kind of narrower um, and also I don't necessarily I, I, I like quite a wide variety of stuff and I do like dystopian stuff yes um, I read another one recently I can't remember the title of but it's like three random words almost like you generate three words from like a oh, citrus something foxtrot something whiskey foxtrot oh, that sounds good but it's not that Oh. Um, keep going Josie keep going. Fox yeah, keep going. Is, <laughs> is one about um, people sort of, people sort of on this caper something to do with technology I, I read it it was fun but um, okay I'll just I'll list three words and eventually we'll get there I think one of them is citrus um, I'll, I'll think of it during this during this program I will <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll, I'll surreptitiously google it but that was very good and I'll find the title of it that was about um, got a kind of um, a, a um, basically food and water is running out and this couple had to go and search for for food and water and there's a, co a complete drought and it's about the base instincts I think within people and how people act when they're in a society versus how they act when they're absolutely desperate and the kind of tribal element within society so I find it really fascinating and also I've always had a deep interest in cults and kind of cult leaders and how cults come about and and that's kind of in that novel too because I suppose power has you know a big part to play doesn't it in in any kind of catastrophe and even now I think yes Gold Fame Citrus by Claire Bay Watkins. Thank you. <laughs> I knew it had the word citrus in it. Do you know what I mean? Gold Fame Citrus is like three words. Yeah. Why can't books just be called This is a book about drought? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that is very good as well, Claire Bay Watkins. Um, but yeah, I think power and now what we're seeing as well is that in a way, the more money you've got, I was sort of reading an article about how people can work from home so much more easily if they're in a kind of more high powered job where they can just flip open their laptop and kind of go, OK, let's have a Zoom meeting versus those people who still have to go out and carry on working who might be in lower paid jobs and kind of everything in between. And it's a complicated thing. But 
um, yeah, I'm very interested in how people change under pressure. And mm. I think often there are surprises that who you think you are, um, who you think you are isn't necessarily, you know, yeah. Well, also, that's never really felt more relevant than now, I think, looking around at kind of what people are and aren't managing to do, managing to do how different people are reacting to this circumstance and, and how that reaction changes over time for all of us as well. Yeah, definitely. And I think there are good things as well. Like, I hope there are people who perhaps had been leading, I don't know, maybe a limited or more solitary or more selfish life and now they're reaching out to their community more and I've done more you know in my community since it started than I ever have before and I've got to know my neighbours more and we're sort of putting things on our doorstep for each other like somehow I ordered like 400 washing up sponges for me <laughs> <laughs> which is a bit I was going into hospital to have my baby and it said earplugs on the hospital list and somehow I ordered 200 earplugs <laughs> you know, massive like like a sweet remember sweet shop that had like bombs yeah, yeah, yeah. they were in like a big a big plastic <laughs> jar like that with like so um yeah put these things on the doorstep and stay on the whatsapp group you know come and take and i love that and before that i was extremely selfish and uh, <laughs> oh, I, don't know. I um i i tried to use this um sort of app for ordering fruit and veg uh, that a friend of mine recommended and it said look usually this app is for restaurants um so you need to be careful because the unit is a little bit confusing and i was like listen i can read units don't worry about me so i ordered like one cauliflower one cucumber and i was like very good very good and then i thought and i was then ordering I thought 12, I was ordering eggs. 12 eggs and i ordered 480 eggs now thank god they were like we do not have 480 eggs these cannot be delivered <laughs> because otherwise i would have just had to go around the whole area being like please take these eggs and i was like it would have cost me so much scandalous. One person ordered yeah, yeah. the eggs. Don't they know that <laughs> the whole neighbourhood would have been taking photos of this delivery guy just <laughs> stacking hundreds of eggs? And also, like, also oh, like, my, oh my gosh, yeah, I was so glad. Initially, I was like, oh my, twelve eggs haven't come, and then I was like, oh, this is weird. <laughs> <laughs> I had that. I I, uh, I went onto a secondhand uh, book site to uh, order a book, and somehow I ordered uh, about seven hundred and eighty. I don't know how that. <laughs> but uh, the um, is can I ask about what, one of the things that when uh, in in stand up you had some some lovely letters uh, from from your mum, the communication you have with your mum, and I was wondering about at, at, at this time in terms of your communication uh, with her, how how is everything oh, there? It'd be so lovely if she was still writing letters wouldn't it, it, it what happened with she those used to letters, write me these very naive letters didn't she from my hometown of Matlock about like local people and how one of them had l looked at the other one's coat because it was <laughs> heavy a coat for April and then it had been talked about for days and, and then when I started to read them out on stage she her letters became slightly more self-conscious because she was aware that I was going to read them out and they were still funny but um it's uh, it's a bit like my dad wrote a porno if the guy had never known that they were doing a podcast about it um that he just could have carried on writing and writing and never known but unfortunately because it when you know that was so successful that people become aware and then they're like oh, I've got to carry on writing it but I think now enough time's gone by that I haven't read them out that I could probably get her to start writing again and then maybe use them as material because I feel completely derelict of creative. I don't know if you guys feel like that too. I, everyone's like, you must be writing loads. And it's like, well, A, I've got two children. One of them's like under two. Mm. But also I feel stuck in this kind of strange bubble where I can't really create anything and I can't, yeah, not really. It's so I, I think a lot of what I, of, what I try and write is either a sort of imagining of the future, usually that's a bit dystopian, or trying to kind of look over how I feel about current events, make a conclusion about that, and then frame a narrative around it. And both of those, it's like, well, we have no idea what the future is going to be like, and we're already in this dystopia. And, you know, I can't get my head around what's happening enough to be like, and this is what we should all be doing, you know? I, I haven't a clue. Yeah, it feels like everything changes on a daily basis and that your feelings change on a daily basis, yeah, well, doesn't it? So it's like, yeah, absolutely. Um, and also, it's the same thing having a, a, 
a toddler and you have this tiny little gap where you're like, okay, this is my creative time. Be creative. And your brain is just like, oh, <laughs> we could sit stultified. <laughs> I know. It's true. Um, Has it made you think? Oh, sorry. Say about no. my mum. My mum's better at technology than I am. So she, we're on a WhatsApp group now and she, um, she's really really great at it and she listens to these roundups every day by this guy called dr john cooper don't know if either of you have watched his stuff he is a, a nurse from the north of england and a, a lecturer i think and he's got a lot of medical knowledge and he talks about all the day's events in a very calm way i don't know if everything he says is correct but i feel like i really want to trust him because he's got a lovely accent in Tambra. so I sometimes watch it's like you've got to watch Dr Dr John Cooper and then he's, she sort of gives me the roundup of, of <laughs> I mean to be honest any opinion piece about coronavirus unless even if you work f for I don't know all, all the researchers or the vaccine is is conjecture in a way isn't it or it's mm -hmm. kind of an angle on it so you know he's as good as anyone else i like his so a, a lot of our whatsapp messages are about Do dr john cooper it's we funny should say how... there, there are sorry. some very good sorry. very good sources of information out there and try and go as much as because i mean what we were talking about the other day is i've i've enjoyed seeing a, a decrease in pundits who are able to just churn out a new opinion on a daily basis they're yeah. still out there but we really th this should be a lesson and it may well not be learned that we really need to have more people who go well do you know what this is what i actually do my whole life i research this i understand this i look at it through a microscope or i work with those communities or whatever it might be to actually have more of those people as opposed to you know the, the toby youngs etc who you know can churn out an opinion based on on absolutely nothing based on a gut instinct I've yeah exactly. gut instinct tip -tip 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 -tip. so i feel like this is the case. don't you think it's showing up showing that everyone it's in a way showing that anyone can kind of have a go at having an opinion yeah 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 like, can i say that this should happen so why shouldn't it <laughs> Um, I just wanted to just wanted to remark that I, I found myself definitely in the past week or so feeling just that I just have no time uh, no time to to mince words. Robin, usually the most diplomatic man on earth, today named a devilish pundit. Robin Ince pulling no further punch punches <laughs> during lockdown. I, Let's see how this goes over the next three days. I try to avoid the ad hominem. You know me. Looking <laughs> back at my past, I have guilt at some of the things that I've said. But but it's hard um, when someone's entire personality is an, an ad hominem, hominem attack on themselves, isn't it? It's tricky. Yeah, the uh, well, there are there, there have been a certain like uh, we talked about this right at the beginning. Every single day for the first week, I was if I went on Twitter, I would go, "Do not press on that trend. That person has some toxic, ill-informed opinion." And then I had a whole week where it was just like, "Oh look, Elvis Costello or someone's birthday." Or do you remember when that lovely person died a few years ago? And then yesterday it returned. There was another pundit, and I was going, "Can I still do it now?" Lent's almost over. Uh, I still <laughs> made it through. Um, the uh, we should find out. Uh, uh, um, about your your show and tell, is he? Yeah, so I was going to show the cat jumper, which Josie knows about. The cat jumper is an ongoing thing, which has been going on for four years. This <laughs> has been the bane of my life. It's going to be too small for for my daughter when I finish it. But it's two cats peering over a wall with paws, looking down on a mouse, which is hangs on by its tail to the jumper and can slot into either of two pockets so um but i can't find it and anyway it's you can imagine it. so this is that <laughs> uh, one day i'll finish the cat jumper and i will post it on twitter and then i'll probably lose it on a train the next day like i did <laughs> the cat that i just knitted um, <laughs> this, um this is a book called um uh the poetry pharmacy and it's tried and true prescriptions for the heart mind and soul i don't read that much poetry um uh, I don't know why. I think it's great. I think it's perhaps because it's a bit like jazz and you can get some shit poetry and you can get some brilliant poetry. And I think sometimes I'm not very good at recognising early on in the poem whether it's shit or good. Are we allowed to swear? <laughs> yeah, um, you are, we are now. All the things have changed. <laughs> also, I mean, we aren't, but I've said everything, but I've said everything bar the C word on one or the other day. So, you know. <laughs> And you said the F word, so I was like, okay. Um, oh, no, I did! Yeah.
it's real life it's real life. <laughs> it's gritty it's broadcasters um, <laughs> but yeah so it's terrible poetry perhaps or mediocre poetry or good poetry i think perhaps i'm not good at the beginning of the poem at detecting um but that's no reason not to to read it and i think sometimes um poetry can sort of get through where where other things can't it can sometimes feel quite piercing like you just need it's like having a shot it's like taking a shot of tequila or something um and it can sort of the, the meaning of it can get through to you depending on how you're feeling so this book's it was sent to ellis my partner who is who is a real broadcaster um, <laughs> how he describes himself on his on our son's birth certificate <gasps> broadcaster and was really serious about it and then he went round to the other side of the man's computer and looked over his shoulder to check that he's typed in broadcaster I am. Um, I wanted to put film star. To put film star on my daughters, but uh, after a, a considered debate, we d- decided that was not representative. <laughs> <laughs> what did you put? I don't I even you... remember. I didn't even remember you have to put you, career. You put you King, Robin. Oh, I bet you put comedian. That's not. <laughs> No, oh. I wouldn't. I, I hate things like that. I'd, um, I'd probably just put writer or something like that. I'd, I'd put something with as much, you know, a, a, a looseness of interpretation, I think. We, we both, both put comedian because we thought it would be funny on her birth certificate to have comedian, comedian. <laughs> and then find out genetically, you know, there, how, how, how that works. If you both have, both have the comedian gene. So that's, yeah, that's uh, the journey we will study. <laughs> what did you put, Izzy? We both put comedian on Betty's. Uh, for that sort of reason, um, and then he transitioned to broadcaster. And now on Stefan's, he put broadcaster, and I think I put writer, and it was like we'd grown up <laughs> in a way. It was like, oh, we're not putting comedian comedian anymore. <laughs> published <laughs> author, you should just for that published <laughs> author. Do we? I'm published author. Yes, yeah, published. Yes, it has to be published. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's your poem? Which one have you, cho- have you chosen one from? So there's loads of great ones in here. So yeah, I was just like, someone sent this to Ellis when I was quite poorly in my second pregnancy and um, he mentioned it on air and they sent this, which was really lovely. He gets sent some things like knitted effigies of himself, which um, uh, perhaps not quite as useful, but this has been very useful in the pandemic. Um, so this is called Nobody and it's by Michael Lasky. And it on the left-hand side, it says the condition and it's supposed to help with various conditions. So this... This poem helps with lethargy, um, but it's also use, useful for self-isolation and um, loss of pleasure in life, which, you know, it would be an understatement to say that, you know, some of us might be going through <laughs> at the moment. Um, so, yeah, nobody, if you can't bring yourself to build a snowman or even to clench a snowball or two to fling at the pine tree trunk, at least find some reason to take you out of yourself. Scrape a patch of grass clear for the birds, maybe. Prod at your shrubs so they shake off the weight. Straighten up or just stump about, leaving prints of your boots, your breath steaming out. Promise, don't let yourself in for this moment again. The end of the afternoon, drawing the curtains on the glare of the garden, a whole day of snow, nobody's trodden. Um, when I read that, I first of all felt like, oh, we don't have a garden. Um, <laughs> thanks, we don't have a garden, so I can't <laughs> stomp about. Um, but I also um, then thought that's lovely um, because the problem I had early on in lockdown was that we were completely self-isolated for 14 days because my daughter had a temperature for one day I don't think she had it but then obviously kids can have low symptoms so we followed the advice we didn't leave the house for 14 days my back was very bad and we just got out of a routine so we didn't um we didn't I didn't get dressed till midday for example I'd have a bath for my back and you know um we she was just kind of watching telly quite a lot and which I don't think there's anything wrong with doing this but there was no structure whatsoever it wasn't like she drew a picture then watched telly for half an hour and then when I read that that was the thing that made me put some structure in because I was like I'm starting to get a bit low really because there's no I'm just wearing tracksuit bottoms and I'm not so once I started to make everyone get dressed and kind of go and do one thing but like a fitness video or something or even just jump around to a song at nine that really helped and that was like I don't know, I felt like I was actively doing something um, 
rather than just being passive. So that was yeah. what that poem said to me, really. It came we're, out, all, we're all trying. Came we're, out. All, we're all trying to evade the feeling of that the Sundays that used to exist in our childhood. Mm. Um, we've got. I just quickly mentioned we're going to go over to uh, it, uh, shortly. We're going to um, join uh, the author Polly Sampson and and lyricist. And I was going to mention uh, that the reason that we do these and the reason that we started these uh, three weeks ago, just just over three weeks ago, was there were threefold. One was we wanted to create some kind of connection because very early on we realised Josie and I and Trent we were talking about the fact that a lot of the people who come to some of the shows that we do they really kind of uh um they uh, they, sorry, I've just seen something on the screen. And no, it is you next, Keisha, just so you know. I was just talking about what's going to be coming up uh, after you. Anyway, so uh, it's quite confusing today. Uh, anyway, we're just doing it to try and get some kind of connection with people and try and get some kind of funding as well for some of the artists that haven't really got any uh, any means uh, at the moment of, of, of and... making money. And a lot of the artists, you th everyone I think thinks that, that most artists make a lot of money. And of course, a lot of them, I was just talking about this with Stuart Lee actually this morning, and, and Stuart, by the way, is on, on on Monday, uh, there are going to be things like bands that just don't exist and people who just go, do you know what, I'm just going to have to stop doing this. And also art centres and small venues yeah. where a well, lot already of thrive. A couple, a couple of days, of days ago, the Artrix in Bromsgrove said that it's going to have to close. It is really sad to see and I just think whatever we can do to try because as well in times like this and if we're looking towards there being kind of a big recession, you can totally see that, that people will start treating the arts as if they're a luxury and expendable and they're not they're a part of everything that is important and they feed into everything else and everything else feeds into them so it is really important so also you, you listen can donate. some of us may not be the wealthiest of people but some of us got an email this morning from Ocado saying that as a valued customer some of us get a priority delivery once a week just for being bougie so you know there's some things that money can't buy but can buy a bit considering it's Ocado but nonetheless well, I just watched a load, load of people say, I take my hand away from the donate button now <laughs> no, that I'm I've seen. I've well, seen a member of the liberal media elite sitting there in her ivory the basement. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You'll get 480 eggs from a cardo. <laughs> That's all I'm going to order from there on. Once <laughs> a week, 480 eggs. And then I'm going to rig up a little sort of cart and I'm going to pull it around saying, essential eggs. <laughs> That's my new life. So the uh, you should watch uh, Flamingos Fling. if you've never seen it, John Waters' movie there, where the, the with the Eggman. Now we're going to go to someone who uh, her work. She uh, I last worked with her at the the Lowry in Manchester, where we we're doing Nine Lessons of Carols for Curious People. Uh, Keisha Thompson's written something that is uh, very beautiful and something that mixes uh, her own uh, not merely love but also a career in science, also with ideas of fatherhood, and it is called Man on the Moon. And Hi, Keisha, uh, how she's are you here now? Hi, Keisha, Hi. how are you? Are you all right? Hiya. Brilliant. Yes, you are working. This is right. working. This is right. um, now. Uh, you were. Were you still touring Man on the Moon when when isolation began? Yeah. So I was supposed to go to um to the Mac, and uh, yeah, lost that gig. That was a bit annoying. But we're having conversations about how I can do it next year or the end of this year. So that's positive. But um, yeah, it felt very strange. Um, and I think this whole thing feels quite linked to this material because my dad is a recluse. Um, so I feel like we're all having to live how my dad lives on mm. a daily basis. Yeah. Yeah, I was, I was weird. Yeah, I was, I was weird. I was, I was talking to uh, Alan Moore yesterday and uh, he said, I'm finding it fine. I was way ahead of the curse. I've, uh, sure. curve. I've been isolating now for 10 years. <laughs> um, the, uh, so this man on the mood, you would, uh, can you give us a little bit for those people who don't know? I mean, it's been incredibly well reviewed and 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 really revered, and I know it's had a, a very positive effect on a lot of people. Can you just give us a little bit of the Story. background of that? Yeah, so it's about my relationship with my dad. I got a commission from Stun Theatre in Manchester, and then was supported by Contact as well. And um, I just got given free reign to make a show, and I was thinking very much about my dad because I'd not heard from him in five months because we communicate mainly through letters and books. Because um, as I said, the way that he lives his life, um, I can't that. So um, a kind of gap of communication threw up the fragility of our relationship and made me have to like confront the 
responsibilities that come along with being a child that you might have to go and look after your parent and it made me confront questions around mental health and masculinity and fatherhood and his kind of identity as a black British man and how that's impacted me and how I understand myself um, so that's what the show is about um, and it's literally just a journey from my house to his house uh, but it's just kind of sprinkled and peppered with loads of memories and songs and musings Brilliant. Well, would you? Uh, you're going to sing two pieces. You're going to sing two pieces uh, from it. Which is the yeah. first one? Uh, the first one's called "Like Him," and I hope this all works because this is the first time that I've like performed for my bedroom. <laughs> we should say that 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 every now and again, yeah, the, the, every now and again, the connection also sometimes it might. But uh, I hope you still get a sense of this this magnificent work. Thank you. Say I have his eyes, the broadness of his nose. They say I'm like him, like from the king in my head to the way I wear my clothes. They say I'm like him. And they say, so I say I'm alive. And they say, so I say I'm alive. So everybody knows me say So I say I'm like So everybody knows Apparently eccentricity It's about planetary orbits and perfect circles and ratios, but some words, they have a special meaning, don't they? That only make sense to you. Because to me, eccentricity is like a feeling. It's that feeling at 6am when I open my door to find a homeless man pushing books about quantum physics through the letterbox. A beard as grey and tattered as his socks. Hair like a platinum crown of electromagnets. He's got freckles all over his hands and his face like butterfly eggs on a cabbage leaf. He's got a face that never seems to age and a concave body that never seems to put on weight. His sunken cheeks they speak of countless days, sipping chicken soup and breakfast tea. He's got wide eyes with camel-like lashes and I see flashes of how handsome he used to be. 
from behind his dry pale skin. Because it's translucent now in the art of simple living. And he smells like old paper, girl page endings and sympathetic dust. He smells like an unread story. The novel that you glance at at the top of your overloaded bookcase. And somehow that feels like enough. Thank you so much. That was beautiful. Thank you. It feels so weird not having any like response. I'm like, ah, can you hear it? I know. I know. <laughs> well, we will. Sorry, Josie. No, no, but it, no, no, but it's such an odd hint of the of the um, total of performance as a performer. It's like, okay, I am doing it, but I could just be doing this to nobody. No, I loved it. Thank you so much. Um, and we're going to so come back. Yeah, and we're going to we're going to come back. We're going to come back to you at the end if that's okay. Oh, what we're going to do oh, is we're going to try and improve the connection by we're, we're all going to drop out right at the end which will just give you the connection because oh, okay. i know because it was it, we, we still got a sense of the beauty of, of, of the song and it was still great but we're going to try and make sure that for the second song if that's all right if we come back to you in 15 minutes yeah. uh then we'll get it this is a great thing this is what one of the, one of the things that we're learning on a daily basis is who has the best internet provider and who's <laughs> slightly let down but that was brilliant that was uh, i remember seeing that that in, in manchester it's a fantastic song uh, um, man on the moon find you... out we'll see keisha at the end and we'll find out uh and and find out more about her work as well go and look up man on the moon yes i want to ask whether you have plans to record the show or whether you've already recorded the show um yeah i've got a recording of it i usually send it to like programmers it's not like filmed in a way like empty live or anything um but yeah i've got an ep and i've got a book with the script and some poems that i wrote alongside it and all that kind of jazz but yeah if you wanted um a link to the show i could send one to you Oh, well, there, yeah. will be, there, there, there will be links under under this uh, as well. So anyone who wants to find out this more, is... uh, you will find out that with all the stuff that we do, uh, there, there are links put up at Cosmic Shambles under these things as well. But Keisha, we will see you again in about 10, 15 minutes. Thank right. you so much. Thank see you. you. See you again. Um, this is my VIP Ocado on my VIP link to the show. Just stop right now. We've actually asked people are asking if they can have their donations back now. <laughs> now they found out not only the Ocado thing to me, yeah, it's kind to all out, of us. But they found out you're the egg queen as well. <laughs> and, and it's oh, just the you know, um the uh oh by the way we've just found out with it, it, it's dr john campbell not dr john cooper so if you go to it's dr john cooper john, uh he may will be john giving cooper entirely Clark. different uh information um we are now going to uh join uh novelist and lyricist i mentioned before uh polly sampson hello polly am i turned on oh yes yeah. hello yeah, hello. Can, yes hello i found the teenager to help Hello. And, and technical <laughs> advisor. This is a wonderful yeah. thing that people that's, have there. That's the term, technical advisor. Yeah. I, I, I think we've all. I, 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 I do, do much, much the same, same thing. thing. I have a twelve-year-old who is my predominant advisor. Oh, handy. That. Yeah. <laughs> I, I had <laughs> media consultant. The, I'm so glad I had a child. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, yeah. Now, now you found. I knew, out, it was, I knew there's a reason. Yeah. <laughs> the, um, before we we talk, we talk about, about your your new book, Theatre of Dreams, I want to talk a little bit about. Um, the, uh, the the lyrics you wrote um, for the album Rattle That Lock and in particular the, the that, that title track Rattle That Lock because you wrote it because of kind of a, a fear I suppose of, of of apathy and a reminder of, of action and I wonder how you feel now in this particular situation where we are seeing some of those things going on now as, as Josie and Izzy were talking about as well we, we are seeing people take action and we are seeing people in terms of uh, in in their neighborhoods etc I, I just wanted your reaction to that well I mean there's action and action but I mean that song was written in um at a moment when people really couldn't take action because they weren't allowed to, to to ever you know have any sort of um protest movement with of any move of, of any meaning because everyone was being slammed into prison and not being allowed to gather in places and kind of shake their fists against um things that were really kind of wrong and um and now we're all locked down and i suppose if we're going to rattle that lock we have to bloody well sanitize it first but, um, <laughs> yeah yeah no it's it's um yeah it's weird it's weird i mean what are we supposed to do now i mean apathy is the thing that we're all 
suffering from, but it's but now suddenly it's been imposed on us and it's not something that we're doing through choice. We're now doing nothing because there's nothing we can do apart from, you know, talk, scream, write stuff. How do you um, find as a as a writer how have you found this? Because uh, we speak we're speaking every day to different creatives and so many people are finding it just so difficult to create in these circumstances. Uh, impossible. I mean I can't, I, I just, I'm just in, I feel like I'm in shock every day yeah. at the moment. It's that, that is the closest I can think. I mean, I'm awake all night, which is horrible and um, just genuinely can't get back to sleep. And that's never been a problem, but it's the daytime also where it's just this feeling of shock and people are sort of talking about the books they're reading and that's really great, but I can't, I can't read a word. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what I'm re even doing with, with myself. I don't know why I'm so tired, except that then I remember why I'm so tired which is it's this bombardment of kind of confusion about what the future is going to be. And if they're, even, sorry, I don't want to be a real downer on this. But, no, but I think we all know. feel the same. It's, yeah. I, I think I, I, it's heartening in a way just, just to, to understand that everyone is going through these same feelings of kind of reeling. And all yeah. I do is now is play p random people on chess.com. Uh, yeah. That's my whole life. <laughs> I think and, that's quite an achievement, to be honest. <laughs> I, I think I just wander around in circles all day, just kind of, and I'm not even aware of thinking about anything that constructive. Yeah. I just don't know what I'm doing. And then at night, it all kind of rushes in. But I mean, this is, I, I kind of elect to live in a shed in my <laughs> normal life because I write and that is what I've been doing for the last few years. But this is very different, you know, when it's when you're not electing to do it, it's a very, very different thing, isn't it? I mm. think. Mm. But isn't there something, I mean, watching for instance, night with emily maitlis talking yeah. about the fact that this is not uh, you know that th th this is not a disease which is, is all about uh, the equality of opportunity that in fact this is a disease and, and with certainly the statistics we're seeing in america again where it's, I, I think they've they've been even uh, sharper some of the people gathering who are the people most likely to uh, become ill that I've not seen that kind of thing on the BBC where someone who is a news anchor will say something which previously everyone, you know, the number of people who would have zoomed in and shouted yeah. something about balance or whatever. So it, mm. in some ways yeah. that new focus and the thing we've talked a lot about on this before as well is seeing experts again finally properly elevated to a position where they can talk from from experience and knowledge. That gives me some kind of hope as well in this uh, isolation. I don't know how yeah. you feel. <laughs> do I feel any hope? Um, I have no, no, I don't know whether I feel any hope, really. That's why I don't, I, I'm, I've got no idea. I've got no idea what's going to, what's going to happen. I've, I've really, that's the problem. I, I just can't form any cogent thoughts about whether this is going to really change people or not change people. I mean, it has to change people. It has to change, you know, the world. Um, but everyone's still so, so kind of, there's so much con concentration on our little island and what our little prime minister's doing and whether he's mm. going to get better or not and actually it's such a waste of noise because mm. this is a global problem and it's always been a global problem I mean you know even before this virus we had a global problem and we needed global solutions mm -hmm. and now mm -hmm. and now we're still we're still talking about our little island and our little prime minister and it's just so weird and when, similarly yeah. like it's it's so depressing not to see the whole like, world how can we pool medical resources yeah, as opposed yeah, to like yeah, got no. these you know. Yeah, exactly. Still, you've got this feeling of who is the who is the sort of who is the, the the you know big pharma guy who's actually got the bloody cure and is just waiting for the best and optimum moment to sort of release it. When you know, it's just horrible. It just makes me feel even more sick than usual if I actually dwell on on it. But I, no, I, I would say about I think there are very positive. I mean, I would say it's worth looking. at, You know, talking to people with things like the Francis Crick Institute and organize. And I do know that a lot of scientists they are all working together and yeah. they're working together internationally that are sometimes these stories aren't as you said unfortunately the main story on the front page is something that stanley johnson said which as you yeah. said so, so 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 parochial and detached from all the other people who are currently suffering but talking to the scientists i think i'm hearing a lot of good things about again international communities pooling their resources yeah. everything That's else off the table this is what we're focusing on yeah, as long as we don't listen, don't listen to Trump, it should be okay. If we can yeah. kind of focus on, you know, scientists and people who are trying to work together and not people who are trying to just... 
isolate and profit. Yeah, I, I, I wear Trump cancelling headphones. They actually uh, <laughs> they, 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 they work really well. That's yeah, like those you filled... can get that replace things that you don't like with pictures of kittens. Yeah, yeah. So, oh, you, God, you, know, you go yeah, on a news site. <laughs> that's all yeah. you can see is just a thousand kittens. I although yeah. do you know what this has been. This conversation has already been helpful for me because I've been thinking about the fact that as oh, a no, writer, I'm getting a phone call. <laughs> <laughs> Oh no! Hang on, but, go away, phone call. Okay, done. I mean, I see, that was good. The, the technical advisor stepped in. <laughs> yeah. Thank but you. I think you're right about how the uncertainty <laughs> of it is so is so paralysing. Because, but then I just thought, well, firstly, I can write about what I hope would happen and what I hope would not happen. Also, I could hedge my bets and write five different possible outcomes, sit on them all, and then whatever happens. Yes. <laughs> oh, I predicted it. I don't need to know about the ones that yeah. weren't right. There must be people who are writing this thing, oh. presuming, and somebody I'm just like anyone can up. write anything. <laughs> yeah, no, me too, me too, completely, completely. Well, we should yeah, talk about the fact that you have uh, your 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 new novel, Theatre of Dreamers, is, uh, and you do, you've done two. I highly recommend anyone to have a look at the events that you've done, where the whole family are gathered together, yeah. and and and, uh, and 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 your husband David is singing songs, and it's it's oh. it's, it's, it's great. Um, but this is uh, about the kind of bohemian environment around Leonard Cohen in a particular period of time in the 1960s. And, it, and it's also about it's about death. And it's about what drew you to that story. I know you are a big fan of Leonard Cohen, aren't you? Yeah, actually, absolutely everything except Leonard Cohen. And um, for a long time, I couldn't write this book because of Leonard Cohen, because um, I felt completely hamstrung because I kept because um, the book is set on the island of Idra, where Leonard Cohen famously had a house. But the people who really interested me were some other people who were there at the same time, who were the people that Leonard Cohen credited with sort of teaching him everything that he knew about writing, who were an Australian couple um, called George Johnson and Charming Clift. And I wanted to write about them. And as I researched their lives, I discovered to my horror that Leonard Cohen had been there at the same time as them. So at first I thought I could just have to write this novel which I was so committed to writing because the more I researched them, the more interested I became. They're like the Ted and Sylvia of Australia, but it's particularly huh. the wife. She's just a charming cliff. She's just this amazing writer and a, an incredible proto-feminist. And, um, and then I kind of got these 1,500 photographs of them in the year that I wanted to write about them. And there was blinking Leonard Cohen in all mm. these pictures. And there was my, my character I wanted to write about with her head on his shoulder. So then I thought, oh, that's okay, because he was a 25-year-old poet at the time. And he'd gone to this island to write his first novel. So I thought, well, he, was, he had a really great work ethic. So in my novel, he can just walk past occasionally whistling. <laughs> and I just need never put him in it. He could just be like this sort of, I could just describe him shambling off to kind of get a coffee and then go back to his novel. And he need never speak. Because the idea of putting words in Leonard Cohen's mouth is just so appalling to me. <laughs> and so I went back to the island um, to sort of start the, the book. And weirdly, while I was there, he died. And so that became the opening of the novel. And then suddenly I was free to put him in, mm. in, a, in a way, because I think I just had this sort of horror that I'd bump into him so, and he'd kind of go, you, you, you know, I mean, as if Leonard Cohen was even going to do that. But it was just such a horrible, horrible thought. Um, and yeah, so then, um, so the novel opens with um, my character, who's called Erica, looking back on her life. And it's on the day that Leonard Cohen died. Um, yeah, so that's it, really. <laughs> I was interested that in sometimes I've seen you interviewed, and and when people have brought up the idea of, of books being autobiographical, obviously not this one, but that, and you say no, no, it's you know sometimes they're from family stories, but you don't yeah. feel that you're you're. And do you find sometimes with the distance of time, I've spoken to a few authors where they go, it's only now, twenty years later, that I realised what I was actually writing about, what I was oh, actually experiencing. Absolutely. Yeah, God, my first book of short stories, I was so outraged. Everyone used to interview me and say, oh, so, you know, what, you know, what, what, these are all about you. And I'd be, kind of get on my high horse and kind of go, absolutely not. And then I saw them the other day and I read them and I thought, how are any of my family still talking to me? This is appalling. <laughs> how is it that my brother can bear to be in the same room? And I did that to him. But I had no idea that that's what you have no idea. Your subconscious, your preoccupations, you know, you think you're writing total fiction and you never are. I mean, even with this, someone pointed out um, and so Marianne Elon is a big character in it and she had this terrible marriage to someone with Axel Jensen before she met Leonard Cohen and in fact there's this sort of terrible karma for this guy because actually he was 
he was a hugely successful writer in his lifetime. He was kind of the Jack Kerouac of Norway. He kind of, his first novel was made into a big film and on the proceeds of his books, he bought sports cars and a house on Hydra <laughs> and a you know, racing boat. And he is remembered in history as, oh, the man that was married to Ma Leonard Cohen's Marianne. I mean, <laughs> and that is like some karmic thing. That, that is how he's remembered because actually he was really horrible to her and horrible to women in general. And... Um, I was, um, I sort of first marriage was to, um, actually he's now sadly died, but to a poet. And I wasn't thinking I had any connection to this story. But then as I was researching Axel and Marianne, I started thinking some of this seems quite familiar, this sort of someone else being drawn into someone's obsession and somebody kind of having, you know, their relationship breaks up when they have a baby because actually, I mean, I've sort of said this elsewhere that this idea of the muse is nonsense. It's just a grown man who needs a mummy you know it's it's nonsense the muse it's rubbish you know and as Leonard Cohen sort of said you know Marianne put a gardenia and a little sandwich on his desk every day well that's kind of what a mummy would do you know so that hmm. baby can do nice crayon pictures you know I do think <laughs> and that's why this idea of the muse is so, you know goes so wrong when people actually have an actual baby because suddenly you know the the person who needed this muse finds that their muse is inconveniently you know breastfeeding someone else but um so, um, sorry. <laughs> anyway, I was then when I was researching Axel, I was at the V&A and I found um, a thing on their revolution um, exhibition that they had. And there was a, um, a poetry reading in 1968 and my ex and Axel had read on the same bill. It was so weird. So you do start seeing that there are these things where. You think it's all made up, but actually the thing that's drawn you to a story in the mm. first place often are that there are shared preoccupations, I think. Well, and I also think that no matter how much you think you're, how much you think you're hiding in your work, it's you yeah. writing it. <laughs> that's, yeah, yeah. It's that it's simple, not, it's not isn't it? Just, yeah. but what's interesting to me is that I do find that women writers in particular, people obsess over the um, autobiographical hints in their work in a way that with male writers it doesn't happen in the same way and I sort of think that it comes from people sort of going oh well this must just be her talking about her life she can't have yeah. fictionalized this she can't no, have... in this act yeah, no exactly. nothing at all <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah crazy there's yeah. an interesting book you might have read it. The the lives of the it, muses. The, the lives of the, the name of the author, the name very, of the author. But it's very and it goes through and and so interesting. The number of times that now in the 21st century, recently, some of those muses people are finding gone. Oh yeah, they were like the Dorothea Tanning exhibition that there was uh, recently. Yeah, yeah, for yeah, a lot, yeah. Or or Leonora yeah, Carrington. Or Dora Meyer. Or yeah, yeah. But they had some actual talent. Wow, mm -hmm. <laughs> amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, even uh, Marcel ah uh, Trent's just put up. It was Francine Prose who wrote uh, yeah. Lives of oh, Music. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's it's interesting. You know, Marcel Duchamp. There's a, there's a, I forget now. There was this incredible character, this the, the, this uh, eccentric woman who went who basically came up with the idea of ready maids. And Duchamp didn't nick it. He kind of he, he kept mentioning it. But everyone's like, no, that makes it no no no. Let's just make it the singular artist, the singular <laughs> male artist, which is kind of intriguing. Yeah. So are you? I imagine you were going to be going off to do quite a lot of, uh, um, you know, publicising the book and doing the festivals, etc. So are you going to now regularly do these events, these wonderful <laughs> kind of barn-based <laughs> events that I was mentioning? Oh, the first, we, we, we did enough, we did two of the, I think of them as the Waltons, really, or the, we've been calling them the Von Trapped family because yeah. actually <laughs> I am my, you know, my my children left home. Well, not this this one was about to leave home, but oh. but they they're, they're all trapped here with us now. So actually, as a mother, it's kind of like oh my children here we all are together again this is a rare treat but um yeah so we did one because my son and my daughter-in-law made this amazing set which was going to be the, the 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 place where everyone met on Hydra this cafe called Katsikas and because we were going to do these events this set was kind of you know built by by my son and and, and daughter-in-law and we just didn't want the set to go to waste because it's so beautiful it's just standing in our barn so we said oh well we'll do a Facebook thing and and just use the set and David and I had written a song that sadly never got finished because as the lockdown happened, we would just get, there was an amazing fiddle player was going to come and play on it. And our wonderful Louise was going to come and sing backing vocals on it. And all that had to stop. And it's just sort of frustrating when you're just about to kind of do these things and you've got so much to say and sing. So we thought, oh, well, we'll just do one to mark publication day. And people sort of liked it. And um, so, yeah, we did another one last night. Um, and it does give us 
also, I mean, completely selfishly, it gave us a sort of focus. It gave us something to work to, you know, as we were all wandering around in this torpor, at least we thought, oh, well, on Thursday night, we are going to do this Facebook thing. And so it kind of galvanized us to actually, you know, Romani kind of was learning the harp. And so she learned the piece on the harp that she could do. And, you know, and everyone kind of did kind of get together and do it. And it was, it was great, actually. It was really nice. I almost prefer doing it from from home than actually having to go anywhere. That's, that's a really, really tragic really, truth. <laughs> but, also something, but also something really beautiful about the whole family pitching in together. It's yeah. really wholesome. Yes. <laughs> uh, it's very Waltons, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I think people enjoy that connection. It's all, you know, it's so much. Yeah. It's re- very interesting watching the number of different artists and, and musicians who are, you know, getting together all over different forms of Zoom or Skype or whatever yeah. and recording together. Um, yeah. The, uh, oh, I didn't necessarily lovely, need. Isn't it? Yeah. yeah. All I, I want to see is the cast, the cast of, mus- of musicals gradually adding to a Zoom call to build to a chorus. That's all I want to see oh, for the yeah. rest of my life. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Polly, um, thank you Polly, so much for joining us. Thank uh, you. Theatre, thank you Theatre of Dreamers much. is uh, it's 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 out now. You can get it on on obviously the the bookshops aren't around you. There are bookshops that are still you know a lot. Of, do look out for the independent bookshops. There's a lot of independent the bookshops. Newham bookshop. that, Oh, Newham, Newham, one of my favourites. She is oh, so great. Every Vivian event, we, 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 we have Vivian. Uh, Newham yeah. Bookshop, the Big shop. Green Big Green Bookshop, Nosy, uh, not Nosy Crow, uh, uh, the, uh, um, across the country, if, if you can, a lot of those independent bookshops are still sending out books. Yeah. And they really, and a lot of them were already a little bit on the cusp. And, and Vivian, yeah. you're right, Newham Bookshop yeah, is no, she's sending one, out of, books one of her front room. <laughs> she, she's um, um, uh, amazing. So if you can, uh, and if you can avoid Kindle, and you're prepared to wait a little bit and then have to leave, the past that's what i find my, my friend jeff who's sending me books i have to leave the parcel on the doorstep for 24 oh, hours so and i know there's I know. books in there's books and i need <laughs> yes. them so, so try and support those things thanks yeah. so much polly and thank, thank you very much as well thank for the you. brilliant thank technical you. advice as well okay, cheers okay. Um, well, we, uh, we're going to go back to uh, Keisha. We're going to disappear now because we're going to try and make sure the connection's as good as possible. As I said, uh, if you can donate, uh, don't worry, I'm not taking any of your money. Uh, we're sharing out amongst some of the acts uh, who at the moment have said basically their diaries are clear now. And we really, really hope we're going to make enough to support some of those art centres, places like the Rondo, which is a wonderful small art centre, and uh, the Pound in Corsham and, and various others. So, uh, Oh, I... let's say bye to Izzy before we go. Oh, well. she's still here. Brilliant. Yes somewhere is he hello, hello! That was How, so are you um now do, do you find i presume like josie the idea of having a structure for a day anyway when you have uh very small children that never really exists anyway does it it's does always it? a dream it's always a dream of structure it's always a dream of structure but i find find that if there is a structure even if you deviate from it there was originally a structure and that makes a difference <laughs> And then when you do deviate then from when it, you do deviate from it, you're like, we've had a really exciting day today because we against the grain. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the nap, nap is, is your, everything centers around the nap, mm-hmm. the baby's nap, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The nap is the greatest part of the day. And I love my daughter. I love any- my daughter more than anything in the world. But the nap is the greatest part of the day. <laughs> <laughs> and and you're, you haven't got much longer either. Yeah. Fading out now, Josie. That Don't beautiful you dare nap. say that. Um, j- just to warn you. She'll uh, be napping until she's 19. Yeah. I'll be taking oh, no, her out in the prep. Time between 13 and 19, you're fine for napping. And then for some reason, it becomes frustrating. So that's a different uh, issue. <laughs> yeah. um, um, Izzy, I know that you've just finished uh, your first novel. Uh, your first novel. So how, is that, how does that feel? I've just finished the first draft. Yeah, sorry. Um, I, no, no. Um, it, uh, my editor's sending me notes. Um she was very specific about the day. I don't know how she knew that it would be, I think it's on the 17th of April. So then I was stop rewriting. Huh? That's my birthday. <gasps> wow. <laughs> it's the present I wanted. Anyway, sorry yeah, to be so You changed it for me, for, for me to see me get my notes on your birthday. Um, <laughs> yeah, so that, um, I'll start doing the rewrites then, which will be quite weird doing rewrites about a book that isn't set during a pandemic. But yeah, that's what I'm doing mainly at the moment. That'll be what I'm doing and bits and bobs like this. Oh, well, thank you so much for joining us, Izzy. Again, go and find out. And yeah, it's great. Shows on BBC Sounds, they would be, wouldn't they? 
my what my radio shows no there's a bit of a fight to get them on there they're not not on there i had been emailing people about it before all this happened but there's other stuff that i've done on sounds like my podcast and stuff and then my podcast the things we do for love is on um is on the podcasts bit of the phone i'm not very good at (laughs) Thank you so much for doing right, this. Cheers, Izzy. Uh, uh, take care. Um, and uh, also mention that tonight, as Josie mentioned before, uh, she and John Luke Roberts will be doing another of their quarantine, quarantine uh, comedy clubs, which is at 8.30, I think, tonight live, isn't it? 8.30 tonight. Um, I am not sure of the bill because even though we're stuck indoors, I'm still no good at my admin. Uh, but we do have... Uh, Anna always... Man, Johnny and the Baptist. Oh! You know, oh my! Uh, oh man, um, what a joy! Um, yes, it's family science show yeah. tomorrow at eleven o'clock live. That's with Helen Chersky, uh, Dallas Campbell, Suze Kundu, and uh, the Scarlet Oak Puppet Theatre as well. So that's family uh, science show uh, eleven a.m. and on that Easter Sunday. Fantastic. Uh, Sunday, three o'clock each Sunday. Uh, we have Chris Lintot, the astronomer. Uh, we have Helen Chersky again. So uh, any questions about oceanography, climate change, uh, physics, physics around the house as well. She's written very interesting things about that. And we also have someone who uh, I met in Toronto is brilliant. Uh, Sarah Parkak, who is uh, a space archaeologist, which means basically <laughs> images taken from space, uh, which mean that we can understand many of the structures which you are not able to see if you were actually just if you were just standing on the earth. You are, and, and she is amazing. And uh, in fact, have a look. She did an interview with Stephen Colbert a while ago. So yeah. we need so space archaeology, astronomy, oceanography, climate change. Send us your questions. What else we do will you ask need? There. That's so cool. What a really cool bill. And what's your what's the rest of your day hold, Robin? Uh, I'm going to be talking to, I'm doing lots of interviews for the book still. So humanist day today, humanist day. That's, that, that, that's what I'm going to be doing. And what are you up to? Um, um, just very much more of the same. I'm hoping to play some chess, do some yoga, go for a walk. You know, uh, I, I'm reading, uh, some of this today, I think as soon as I can. And oh, we should mention uh, 10 a.m. show back on Monday. On oh, well. Monday, we have uh, Stuart Lee will be joining us as well. That would be a lot of fun. He can give us some insight. I think of all the people I trust, it'd be all him and Al. I trust it'd be him and Alan Moore. <laughs> the, uh, we'll never get Alan Moore on this level of technology. <laughs> <laughs> just one Baker Light phone at his house. He'll write us uh, a letter <laughs> and we can read it out. Okay. Um, We'll hand back to Keisha. Keisha, thank you so much for joining us uh, again. We're going to disappear. Uh, this is another song, isn't it, from uh, Man on the Moon? Thank you, yes. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks very much, you. Keisha. And uh, keep up to date with her work. Bye-bye. See you over the weekend. Okay. So this song is called Sometimes. Um, and it's about me imagining me hugging my dad because I've not done that. Uh, here we go. Sometimes I Sometimes I like to imagine Sometimes I like to imagine what it would feel like if I Sometimes I like to imagine what it would feel like if I Feel this big on my neck Fit myself into the cave of his chair Play dot to dot with freckles on his forehead Hey, 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 I wanna know What does he smell like? 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 Sometimes I What does he smell like? 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 Yeah, oh, hey, 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 oh, hey